Welcome, everybody. Thank you all for being here. It's wonderful. Uh, my name is Avram Friedman. I'm the executive director of the Canary Coalition. And everybody here should know that we are live streaming this today. So uh, this could potentially be watched anywhere in the world at the moment. Um, some of you uh, may not know about the Canary Coalition. We are a nonprofit organization, a grassroots organization based in Silva, North Carolina. And uh, our issue uh, involves uh, bringing clean air back to the mountains of western North Carolina. And um, we work on climate change issues. And that's, that's the reason that we are involved in, in this program, the Solarized Western North Carolina program, because we understand that energy efficiency and solar energy will bring clean air and address climate change. But in fact, today, there is another important reason to be in favor of solar energy and energy efficiency. And that's because it's economical. It makes financial sense to get involved in solar energy now. As never before, the price of solar energy has dropped dramatically in the last five years. And um, it's become a practical solution for many people. We believe almost all people. Certainly energy efficiency is. And, and so uh, we have teamed up with uh, Clean Energy for Western North Carolina. Ashley Edwards here is representing Clean Energy for Western North Carolina. And this program is going on very successfully all over the state. People are buying into solar energy now. We're going to explain to you how uh, tax incentives work, how utility incentives work, um, and how it's possible to get financing to make it profitable for you to invest in solar energy now, invest in energy efficiency now. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce Ashley Edwards of Clean Energy for Western North Carolina. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Avram. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Ashley Edwards. I'm the Outreach Coordinator for Clean Energy for Western North Carolina. Uh, this is our second installment of Solarize WNC, uh, which has uh, been awesome so far. And uh, I love looking out at a crowd and seeing lots of, lots of faces. So that means that we're, that we're making an impact and that we are uh, educating the public on, on solar and energy efficiency, and its importance, its economic value, and uh, uh, its environmental uh, value as well. So thanks for being here. Um, uh, I want to start out by maybe asking you all um, if someone would volunteer maybe to, to tell me why they're here this evening. Just a really simple answer. What, what's interesting to you? Sorry? In case any of it's free. In case any of it is free. <laughs> right? The yeah. I wish to solarize my home in the future. Okay. That's good sudden exposure and awesome. why not? Awesome. Have you been down this path before or uh, passive. Passive. California, Excellent. But not here. So you're familiar with that too. That's very important. Cool. Thank you. Our, our business has a thirty thousand dollar a year electric bill. Like that's some incentive <laughs> <laughs> that's some incentive great you got some good roof uh, roof exposure and, and some room yeah. awesome awesome anybody else want to share with us while they're here yeah so we got you versus now hello power line my bill's going up about 100 percent i've got my usage in half still All right well it's not 100 percent i mean my bill's still more even though half the usage mm -hmm. since i don't use much mm-hmm Cool. So, are you interested with like a grid tied system, or are you? There you go. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, our Unitarian Universalist Fellowship here at Franklin wanted to go solar when we built it about mm -hmm. six or seven years ago. We couldn't quite afford it, so I want to find out I, to revisit the issue now. Great. That's great. We've we've helped some uh, congregations in Asheville. Uh, go solar, and there's a couple different methods that um, that we can help you with to do that. So awesome, cool. All right, well, we'll get started with the presentation. Um, uh, I've got. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the program itself, uh, and then I've brought a couple of the companies that we work with uh, to uh, pull off this uh, awesome program. Uh, a solar representative from Sugar Hollow Solar, uh, and an energy efficiency uh, representative from Conservation Pros. 
Um, and those are a, a couple of really strong partners of ours that we have uh, been using for a while now and, and have been super happy with. And so uh, they're going to give you some more in-depth information about each of those segments. And so um, uh, I hope you guys enjoy this. So what we have done here is uh, Solarize WNC is a grassroots partnership between uh, Clean Energy for Western North Carolina uh, and the Canary Coalition. And we want to bring energy efficiency and solar to the western counties out this direction. Um, we have, and you'll see this later on, we've worked in several other places around uh, the state of North Carolina. Um, I've been mainly involved with uh, the Asheville area, Hendersonville area, and the western North Carolina. And so um, it's exciting to come out this direction. The response that we've gotten so far has been overwhelmingly positive. And so um, it really excites me to be out here. And the mission that we are working on here is to reduce the use of fossil fuels by accelerating the adoption of clean energy and energy efficiency uh, in homes, businesses, and organizations. So this is open to um, basically anyone uh, that it, the, the fact that you have a business or you have a nonprofit or uh, it's just for your home is, is not a matter. We can, we can work with you on that. Um, and you'll see, uh, we, how we accelerate the adoption of, of clean energy. Probably a lot of you have gone part of the way down that path before, either through um, thinking about it uh, and, and hit a snag or actually walking down that path and maybe hit a, hit a roadblock. And so um, those are the, the types of things that we try to um, help, you, help you through, those, those hurdles. Uh, so we are a regional program designed to help communities adopt clean energy and invest in energy efficiency. We offer a clear path to utility savings, uh, efficiency, and environmental peace of mind. Um, the program is no cost to enroll, bears no obligation, uh, and you'll see how to enroll uh, later on. It's a, it's a really easy process online. Um, there's no obligation at all for anything, for any information that you receive through this program, any assessments that you uh, receive through this program. Um, and we have negotiated reduced pricing for you uh, ahead of time. So the, the bargaining isn't really something that you need to worry with either. Um, and we are currently being able to offer energy audits in this area for a reduced cost of 75%, uh, which is around 100 bucks for uh, an energy audit for your home. And $20 of that uh, energy audit fee is going directly to Canary Coalition and our, our partner in this. And so we're really happy about that as well. Western North Carolina. All right, it's a short little video, and then I'll kind of elaborate. Communities in Western North Carolina to adopt solar power and increase the efficiency of their homes, businesses, or organizations. To do this, the program resolves three main issues cost of financing, education, and installation. We've cut costs by negotiating a discounted rate through group purchasing, allowing companies to concentrate on installation instead of sales and marketing. The discount from these initiatives totals almost 18%. We've also organized energy audits that identify ways to use less energy and save money on fuel bills. As far as financing goes, we've researched all the options to help further drive down upfront costs. The second focus area is education. We're offering educational sessions for the public to learn about the technology, tax credits, and financing options, as well as ask questions firsthand to installers. The third and final focus area of Clean Energy for Western North Carolina is installation. We've already selected the equipment and contractors for you, therefore eliminating all the confusion beforehand. We're excited to be working with Asheville Solar Company, Conservation Pros, Energy Investment Partners, Haynes Energy Solutions, Renewable Design Associates, and Sugar Hollow Solar to bring you this campaign. So I can tell you all that, but it I'm really happy about that video and it makes me happy to, to, to show that to you guys. And so I, I just like to elaborate on that because it, I think it gives a, a nice little overview on the target areas that this program tries to go after uh, to help people with, with those hurdles. Um, so like I had mentioned before, we have uh, done several other campaigns and we've also, um, okay, I'm sorry, Auburn's gonna pass around the sign-up sheet again. Uh, we have quite a few more people sitting in, uh, sitting in here than had signed up and so if you wouldn't mind, uh, just jot down your information on that sign-up sheet for us. I'll just pass it <coughs> <on> this <coughs> cool. Um, we also assist in uh, solarized projects, uh, other solarized projects around, uh, which is uh, where some of these numbers and locations come from. Because um, what's unique about this program uh, that a lot of other solarized programs don't offer is the energy efficiency portion. 
Um, so we've, uh, we've got several other programs running right now. Uh, Raleigh is, uh, is still kind of in the works, um, and Orange County and Triad are both uh, solarized projects. Um, Boone is a, um, is, a, is a new startup for us, which has really uh, also had really great success. Um, Buncombe, Asheville, Hendersonville has kind of finished up, but we're still, uh, you know, letting people enroll if they wish. Uh, and now Western North Carolina. And through these programs, um, there's been a, over a thousand people sitting in rooms like you guys are today. And so we're really happy and proud that we've been able to educate folks on uh, the benefits of solar and energy efficiency. Uh, we've done over 290 solar installations uh, and over this, and these are numbers are a little old now, but over 45 energy efficiency contracts from over 400 audits. And so that's a, that's a big impact for a grassroots campaign. Um, and we're really proud of that. And what's that, what that has led to is uh, 1.5 megawatts of rooftop solar statewide from, uh, the, from the clean energy programs and solarized programs. Um, I, when I'm in Asheville, it's, it's an easy, relatable figure for me because a lot of people will drive by the Biltmore Estate on 40. Um, that's about a megawatt. And so we've done that plus another half of that uh, through these programs on, on rooftops across North Carolina. And so that's, this is a, a wonderful thing. Um, and what that means for, our, uh, for local economies is $8.5 million in revenue. Uh, nothing to slouch at. That's, a, that's, a, uh, that's great for uh, installers uh, and uh, also great for uh, local businesses and, and folks that can take advantage of this. So um, that's something that we're really proud of. So how does this work? Uh, how does clean energy for Western North Carolina work? Uh, well, ahead of time, we, will, we vet and select solar installers and energy efficiency companies. And we do this through what's called an RFP process. And that's a request for proposal. Um, back in the summertime last year, we sent out uh, this RFP uh, and vetted over 60 companies in Western North Carolina, Eastern Tennessee, uh, and Northern uh, South Carolina and Georgia. So uh, a lot of local companies sent in uh, the information that we requested. Um, and that information uh, in included financial records, uh, references, um, equipment, uh, pricing, uh, and so all these things were laid out for us and we were able to take uh, weeks to go through all these proposals that we got and were able to really pick and choose who we thought were the best for this um, uh, program, uh, who we thought were, was going to perform uh, the, the best for you all. And I think we really nailed it. We, we really hit the, the nail on the head, so to speak. Um, and we're able to negotiate discounted pricing, like the video said, uh, lower 18% lower than the national average, which is um, about 15, 12 to 15% lower than the, than the North Carolina average. And so that work has been done ahead of time. Uh, we've negotiated discount solar pricing and energy audits. Like I said, we partner with local uh, governments and nonprofits to help with outreach. Um, like uh, uh, the Canary Coalition out this direction. We've also worked uh, with uh, the Western North Carolina Alliance, which is now Mountain True. Uh, we worked with uh, a couple of the Sierra Club chapters uh, throughout North Carolina as well, uh, and, and countless other partners um, that have helped us you know, get the word out about the program. Uh, we conduct free educational events to explain the program, tax incentives and rebates and, uh, and, and our services, and that's, that's where we are today, and these are um, events that we, we put on uh, purely for, for educational purposes to help you guys down this path. The, the contractors uh, perform audits and free solar assessments, deliver proposals, and then they contract directly with the participants. That would be you all. And what are we targeting here? And so we've found uh, that there are three real uh, issues with adopting clean energy. Uh, cost, uh, red tape, and, and education, or um, uh, uh, or lack thereof, and I don't, and I don't say that in a, in a mean way, I'm just saying that a lot of people like yourselves are here to find out more about this. And um, so we've negotiated discounted pricing. We vet, in, uh, we vet service providers ahead of time, uh, which allows you guys to do less work uh, and adds to our value proposition. And then again, we have uh, free info sessions and, and offer free resources. And, and one of those, which I'll get to in a second, is, is our website. It's got a, uh, a, a wealth of information there, frequently asked questions and things for you all to, to come back to if, if we don't quite get to what, what you, we need to tonight. And this is an example, this is also on our website, of something that uh, kind of the, the typical path that you would find um, if you were deciding on energy efficiency or solar. 
Um, and this is kind of a step-by-step -step process that, that we and our companies help, help walk you through. Um, and you don't need to take notes or capture a mental picture of this. This is, this is available on our website as well. So a call to action for you all. Um, now's the time to, to purchase solar and invest in energy efficiency. Uh, there has really been no better time than the present to do this. Uh, prices have dropped significantly uh, in the past few years. Um, some figures up to 80% of equipment costs in the past few years, uh, which uh, only helps with your payback period and, and helps you recoup your return on investment. Um, the 35% North Carolina tax credit is expiring at the end of this year, uh, which a, a lot of you may know. Uh, this is the lowest equipment cost and utility rates uh, continue to increase. And so this is a great way to protect yourself from those utility rate increases as, as we go on. Uh, the latest one I believe happened in either late December, or early January and Duke hiked the rates 4%. And if you think that's the last time that that's gonna happen, you're kidding yourself. Um, it's gonna continue to happen. And this is a great way to, to buffer that, uh, both energy efficiency and solar production. Uh, you can increase your home value through this as well. Um, it, adding solar and, and, and doing energy efficient upgrades only adds to the value of your home. Save money on monthly utility bills, which it sounds like quite a few of us are interested in that. Uh, and reducing your carbon footprint, which is, which is an amazing thing as well. We all, I mean, you guys live in, in one of the most beautiful places around, I think. And so uh, these are all resources that we're trying to protect um, because we have seen <coughs> you know, the environmental damage and environmental impact that um, fossil fuels cause us and uh, fracking and, and, and these things that keep coming up, um, you know, we need to reduce the need to, to go out and, and look for these uh, hard to find, one single use, um, really damaging uh, fossil fuel uh, energy supplies. Um, so that's it for now from me. Uh, I'm gonna hand this over to uh, Marcus and he's gonna tell you a little bit more about um, the <coughs> energy efficiency side of things for uh, residents. And um, so I'll welcome Marcus up here. Just there on keys. Yeah, arrow back and forth. Thanks, Ashley. Um, glad to see everyone. Great, great room, uh, filled well. Uh, let's get into energy efficiency. I, th this is the unsung hero portion. This is the dirty work that you don't get to show your neighbors the air sealing in your crawl space. You do get to show them the <laughs> solar. So I'm gonna to try to convince you that even though you can't show your neighbors the shiny stuff on your roof, this is still very important and actually will add more value to your solar system. Well, we got an, a, an issue with our homes. We have inefficient homes. Our homes were built by the lowest bidder. It's true. As consumers, we have chosen the lowest bidder. And we don't do that when we have an automobile. We want a nice car that's safe and somewhat efficient, has warm to heated seats. With our home, we say, look, who's gonna do it the cheapest? And guess what, we get the cheapest, right? So then I get to run a company that fixes all this stuff. Um, so efficiency first, and it's the first step on the way to a net zero home. Ideally, our home makes as much power as it needs and then puts a little extra on the grid or uh, uh, takes care of our, our needs. Um, not one solution, unfortunately. It's not just a blow and go. Get the insulator in there, blow the attic with the insulation. You're good, put solar on the roof. We have a lot of intricate systems in our homes that we'll get into a little bit. So we have to look at what, what are the solutions for, for your home. Each individual home is gonna be different. It's best to, best to treat the symptom or the problem, not the symptom. Uh, we have that problem in many of our fields, including medical, so we wanna deal with the real issues there. Um, and then we have a lot of benefits, not just efficiency. We get better indoor air quality if you seal your ductwork and you seal the holes in your floor. You're not breathing your crawl space. I'm no doctor, but I find it very interesting that when you look at first world nations, we have twice the respiratory illness in this country. We spend twice the amount on medical uh, issues than other developed nations. And we also are pretty much the only country that uses crawl spaces. Hmm, respiratory illness double, crawl spaces uh, more than anywhere else. Is, that connect is there a connection there? How many of you like hanging out in your crawl space if you have one? <laughs> I never get a raised hand, I don't know why. I like crawl spaces, they're cool, I think. Yeah, they're, they're disgusting, they're horrible. So, indoor air quality health is probably the, the most important part of what we do, even though we bill it as energy efficiency. We have the financial aspects. Energy efficiency is gaining, uh, uh, minimizing your needs, so you gain some money back in your pocket. 
We'll look at investment strategies. If you're an investor of any sort, um, this is the best investment strategy you have available to you as a consumer. Wow, that's good. I should open up an office downtown. Um, <laughs> safety, combustion appliances, wood stoves, boilers, uh, furnaces, water heaters, anything that burns the fuel in our home is dangerous. Carbon monoxide, we're putting it into our place where we want our families to be raised um, and we can create issues. 1,500 people die a year in America from household related carbon monoxide issues. So that's something we're very concerned about and we'll make sure that any work that's done um, doesn't uh, compromise that. Durability, if you take a log and you carry it out in the woods and you put it there and you come back in a couple of years, it's gone, right? Well, we build out of those logs and uh, it's very interesting, Appalachia is the hardest climate to build in. Northern Canada, no problem, heat it. Southern Florida, no problem, cool it. Here we have what's called a mixed humid climate. We have warm, wet summers and dry, cold winters. So the way we construct our homes technically should change each season. Of course, we can't do that. So we hope our homes have some issues with that. And then comfort. How much is comfort worth? A lot, right? I go regularly go to homes that are new even, where they say we can't use our bonus room in the summer, it's too hot. Our HVAC contractors come out and check it, their system's great, so we don't know what's wrong, we just don't use it. Well, that's a lot of real estate, that's expensive stuff, we want to be able to use those things. Why do we have building issues? Well, just like our cars, and I do a lot of analogies to cars because they're very similar, our homes are a system full of systems, and I'm going to actually back up. Here's a system here. This is a bath van in an attic. And you think, oh, it's a bath van. Big deal. There are a lot of things going on with this bath van. Number one, it, this is in the attic and you can see the white insulation around there. Well, there's no insulation where this bath van is. So the thermal com uh, envelope has been compromised. It's a hole in the house. So the air pressure plane has been compromised. There's no duct on that. So anytime you take a shower and turn the bath van on, humidity is coming into your home. So there's a lot of, or in your attic. There are a lot of things going on with this one simple system, and who's responsible for this system? Well, on the construction side, everybody does this. Oh, you, you, you. So we, we have a problem that nobody's responsible for these things. So when we look at comparing it to an automobile, our automobiles have lots of systems in them, just like our cars. Unfortunately, uh, unlike our homes at the automobile many design center or skyscraper, you know, the, the brake engineer will walk down a few flights of stairs to the um, uh, exhaust engineer and say, hey, I want to make sure that your exhaust system isn't too close to my brake system so we don't boil the brake fluid and all these cars crash. They go, okay, great, let's make sure that doesn't happen. Then they'll run it around a racetrack a few times, smash into a couple of walls, go to the government and say, this is a safe vehicle. We can sell it to the public. And they great, sell it to the public. Well, that doesn't happen with our homes. Uh, nobody talks about how all these systems interact with each other. And then we have all these problems that start happening and homes cost us a lot. And we realize that, oh, the gutter was leaking and I never really fixed it for $20 and now it's $2,000 to repair the roof. We never read our homeowner's manual, right? We have an, a car owner's manual, tells you when to maintain it. How many of you read your car owner's manual or your homeowner's manual? That's a trick question. It doesn't exist. Why do we spend twenty or $30,000 on a car? You get a manual, you get a dashboard that tells you what's going on. You have cars that now talk to you. Time for an oil change. We could buy a car for 10 times that amount. And you get this little, little two numbers on a wall that you were told is the temperature number. I'm not sure. Hopefully the person that told you that's not lying to you. We have no controls in our home. No way of knowing what's going on in there. We have problems. So what we want to do is get in there with the, the, the goggles of building science or building performance and say, what's going on in here? Let's test it. It's like taking your car into a, a shop nowadays. They, they, they don't look at your car in the parking lot and go, oh yeah, it's gonna be about 800 bucks. We'll get those five things fixed. They go, let's plug it in. Let's let the car tell us what's wrong with it. Same thing with what we do with building performance. Now, when we look at things, people go, oh, energy efficiency. I need new windows. Well, it turns out that windows are the second to last thing you need to replace, unless they're falling apart or are a security issue. What this is, is the pyramid of conservation. And as you go up, things get harder and more expensive. So down at the bottom, we've got the low hanging fruit of just knowing how your home operates. Having that indoor outdoor thermometer and an indoor outdoor humidity meter, you know, what's going on uh, outside versus inside, in the attic, in the crawl space, a number of ways to look at data in your home. Not just saying you should or have to, but you can do that. Second thing, as we go up, turn things off. Okay, we all know that mom screamed us, uh, at us uh, doing that for, I still stand in front of the refrigerator though, going, 
And I know what's in there, but it's something innate with us, with power maybe. Lighting, so lighting is where you spend your, when you're getting your wallet out, first thing to do, replace your light bulbs. Even to the point of there's a compact fluorescence now. LEDs are here, they're here to stay, and they're affordably priced. Then air sealing. Okay, we're putting more money in. We're gonna pay a contractor to come in and air seal, maybe do a blower door test, uh, really figure out where we're losing air. Air sealing is important because this is the number one loss of energy. Installing insulation without air sealing means you're getting about 50 to 60% of the efficiency of the insulation. So if you had insulation installed in your home, have somebody come in and air seal and you'll get the best bang for your buck out of that insulation. Appliances have come a long way. The energy code has changed. Uh, a fridge that was built 10 years ago is gonna cost you about $13 a month to operate. A fridge that is built today is gonna cost you about three. We can do the math on if it's worth it to replace that running refrigerator. Well, it is. As we go up, you can see the third to last thing you do is replace your heating and cooling system. Now, when your house is cold, you call your HVAC to, uh, for person up, and they go, great, man, we got some new technology, we've got a high efficiency unit, we're gonna replace your system. And you go, okay, well, that's a lot of money. Is it, will it make my house more efficient? Not necessarily, and it might actually cost you more in the long run. Then we get to windows. It turns out that windows don't lose as much energy as other parts of the home. Uh, and we'll look at why that is. Also, the return on your investment to replace your windows is about 20 years. So don't replace your windows first. Now, I'm not saying don't do it, but don't do it first. Do all these other things. So I've gone to plenty of homes that have old, single-pane windows, and they go, oh, I need to replace my windows. And I'll, I'll, let's do an energy audit and see. Now, find other things, and they'll actually go forward with the work and they never will replace their windows because we solve their problem, their comfort issues or their energy expenditure issues. Now, we talked about investment. If you are an investing type of person and you haven't already done efficiency, I've got something to sell you. <laughs> Let's just look at this quick graph. This is the EPA graph, it's a little dated. On the right for you are investment strategies available to us. So we have a 30 year bond, a 4.2% return on your investment. In the, in the 90s, the stock market was doing pretty good. A 14% return on your investment if you did it right. Uh, some other things, money markets and such. Now these numbers have changed over time, but very low returns. In the middle, the colored bars are at the bottom, energy efficiency upgrades that you can do. So changing out light fixtures, this yellow bar on, uh, on the left, duct sealing. Look at the duct sealing return on your investments, 42%, 41% returns way better than any traditional investment strategies that you have. We typically don't make a recommendation that won't pay itself off in less than seven years. Many of the things we do, such as duct sealing, can pay themselves off in two to five years, depending on the home. So we can see when we add up all the energy efficiency uh, investments, the return is at 16%, far better than any other option that you have. And this is an investment in your property that you can, re you can sell that to the next buyer. You can say, well, this house is better. Tell the appraiser, show them what has been done, and they will, it will appraise higher. Here we see why we're not dealing with windows. The number one energy loss in our home is through air leakage, uh, and this is based on 50 years of research by a lot of uh, organizations that have plenty of scientists that have dealt with this. And we find that as we heat, we spend more money on heating, heat rises, creates a positive pressure at the ceiling, negative pressure of the floor. The heat escapes through all the things that we put in our ceilings and like uh, lighting and uh, duct work and plumbing vents, all sorts of things. And then as it escapes, it, that negative pressure draws in that cold air from below. And if you're unlucky, that cold air is being drawn in through your crawl space or basement, that is not necessarily the healthiest thing. So when we look at from an air leakage standpoint, your windows are on the walls which have a neutral pressure. Now you feel that those windows leak when the wind blows, but the wind doesn't blow all the time. Um, you feel the air come through the windows when your dryer vent is on removing air from your house or your bath fan, but those aren't on all the time. If your windows are closed, the stack effect is happening. So anytime your windows are closed, air is moving through. If you air condition, the air moves the other direction. So you're pulling air from your attic. The taller the house, the worse this is. I've gone into newer homes that are three stories. I walked in the door on two of them, wiped their dining room table, during the summer, I told them what kind of insulation they had in their attic because it was just raining down. They had excessive recessed lights, which we wish were outlawed, and it was just raining down attic air and insulation dust on our homes.
All right, moving along. Safety. This is a uh, this is a water heater. This is called an atmospheric combustion water heater. It's using air from around it for combustion. When we go in an air seal, we want to make sure we don't cut off the pathways for air, and these also can be malfunctioning. You can stick your hand in the flue um, here. We wish these were outlawed as well because they can uh, cause problems. And if you notice on the lower right, that's a little plastic ring that's blue uh, that shows the cold water line that has melted because this water heater was venting into the house. So we definitely want to be aware of those types of things. Now here's a reoccurring example. I see it all the time. This lady said, oh man, uh, my house, two rooms can't get, I can't heat them. Call my HVAC company. And I'm not picking on HVAC companies, but I sort of am picking on HVAC companies because this happens all the time. Because they sell one solution. And, and that's fine if they want to do that. They sell the boxes. Ten, that box is $10,000, top of the line, super efficient unit, gas pack unit. Awesome product, yes. Did she need it? Well, her older system was actually still running. So our attitude in the building performance industry is do all these other things. If your system's running, fix everything else because you're going to get a better bang for your buck and then replace it. We saw that on the pyramid of, of conservation. Was high up was HVAC replacement. Well, finally they stopped answering her phone because she said, my house is still cold, my house is still cold. So they all stopped answering her phone calls. So she calls us. We go in the crawl space. Her duct system had come to the end of its life and it needed replacement. So instead of $10,000, she could have spent $3,000 and fixed the problem. Now we also have to keep in mind that many times your duct system and your building envelope where we store the heat, you know, three things are happening with conditioning. You create the conditioned air, the heat or cold, you distribute it generally in duct systems and for forced air systems, and then we store it in the building envelope. Three things, weak link here, you know, you have a weak link, none of them is working efficiently. You know, this high 98% efficient or 95% efficient unit was connected to a 0% efficient duct system. We went from 95% to 40% efficient system overall. We have to keep in mind that the, generally the distribution system is going to stay in the home forever. The building envelope where you store that heat is going to be there forever because that is the house. This box gets replaced. I go into homes that have had five fuels in their life, 100 year old homes, five fuels have come and gone, five heating systems have come and gone in that home. So let's make the house better and then we can plug and play any box that, that goes in there that's going to last, you know, 12, 15, 20 years, we hope. Moving on, indoor air quality. Oh. This is the first time I've seen upside down growing mushrooms. Now this was from a roof leak that never got repaired. And now this is getting ready to cost thousands of dollars. Luckily we caught it in time. The joist hadn't started to rot. The floor, the floor uh, deck did start rotting and growing mushrooms. So we look for these types of things. We don't want to be breathing this stuff in. We live in that forest in Appalachia, things rot. So we have to do something about it. Um, if, I know I used to live in Boone and uh, we didn't air condition because you didn't need to. And all the leather belts and shoes molded in our closets. And it was just like, oh, every once or twice a year you had to clean them all up. Here's a fun thing. Luckily you won't have the opportunity to do this for a few more months, but the next time it frosts or snows, drive around. Here's a house that obviously has in the foreground has a couple of leakage points melting the snow. In the background though, we have, notice the eaves are nice and cold. So we have heat, money, dollar bills coming out of the house and melting the snow on the roof and, and we don't need to do that. Also this can create what's called ice damming where the water freezes on the eaves and backs up into the house and causes water damage in the attic or even throughout the home. Here's another one. We say, well, you know, many people that buy a home and I'm there shortly after they move in and I find all these things. They say, why did my home inspector catch this? Like, ah. You know, you know, there are a number of reasons, but this is where we have uh, our trades who work in our homes have blinders. They're very good at what they do, one or two things. From the standpoint of building science, we come in and look at that house as a system. How are all these systems interacting? So this is a, a situation where they had a re-roof, new roof come on, and these are two bath fan vents from two different bathrooms, one on each floor. And the roofer said, oh, you know, they probably only need one bath vent. So they literally cut the pipe and folded it down and kind of pushed it in. And you can see now that the, the black is the tar paper where they roofed over. So they removed one bath vent and now it, if it is venting, it's going to vent into the attic, which is not good because of course our bathrooms are uh, a huge source of water. Did they know about building science and that that wasn't a bad idea? Maybe, maybe not, but we need to get somebody that's responsible for the house as a system, not just focusing on all these different systems. So 
Homework. You didn't know you were going to have homework. You probably wouldn't come. <laughs> if you can get in your attic and do like this person, they're standing on a ladder in their attic hatch and they just pull the insulation away from the walls. What they're showing, this is it's kind of ugly. Attics get ugly over time. This, the white wood is dead wood that they use to connect the sheetrock to. And that staining is air leakage. I can go in any, any house that's about 10 years old, you've got staining wherever your light boxes are, wherever your wall top plates are, and this is an interior wall top plate. That's dust coming out of your home. So in, this, in the winter it rises out, goes filters through that insulation. Insulation is not an air barrier. If somebody said, what do I do in an attic? I don't have anything up there. I'd say air seal before adding insulation. If you, if you have one choice, air seal, because it's much more effective. Now in the summer, if you're air conditioning, that air is filtering back through that. I go up, you know, people that burn incense, smokers, man, you can, smokers, this isn't a smoker's house, by the way, this is a standard home. This is just living in a home. If you use a wood stove uh, or fireplace, it's even worse. So check out that, that's your homework. And this is one of my favorite pictures. This house is less than a year old and costs over a million dollars. Why didn't my home inspector catch it? Maybe they didn't get in there. They got a nice long list of, hey, if we miss anything, we're not really responsible. So this was horrible. Children were living in this home. They had to move out, totally redo this. Notice the fiberglass is just saturated. Basically, a gutter drain was draining into the crawl space, and nobody knew for a year. We do have rebates out there from Duke, which is great. There is one tax credit. We've had tax, the, you know, we're the dirty guys, so the solar guys get all the tax credits. We, we, will, we had one, and they took it away, and now we've got one small tax credit. But Duke does offer rebates because Duke knows that doing this stuff is effective, and they want us to do that. Um, and this is a person that went through the program, and um, we did a lot. She went uh, extensive energy efficiency work and then put solar on. So um, my uh, uh, analogy is, is having a house with solar panels on it that hasn't had energy efficiency upgrades is kind of like having a, a hybrid car like a Prius. You got great technology under the hood, but it's got flat tires. So the system <laughs> of that Prius, that hybrid car, is greatly flawed because you're just going to be flapping down the highway getting you know, two miles a gallon. So let's get those, pump those tires up on your house before you go solar. And we'll definitely have a question and answer session after this, I believe. And, Turn it back over to Ashley or right. Thanks, Marcus. Yeah. Clap it up. Clap it up. Don't be shy. <laughs> I told him that all you guys were here to see him. And so it really <laughs> pumped him up. Um, so we're, now we're gonna uh, welcome Ben Yoke. He uh, works with Sugar Hollow Solar uh, and he is one of our two uh, residential uh, solar providers for, for our program. Uh, and so Ben's going to tell you uh, lots about solar, and then I'm going to come back on, finish up uh, the little program piece, and then we'll do a do a Q and A for you. Hello. Hi. I'm going to try and move through mine kind of quickly because I, I really like to answer questions. So I mean, we've been sitting here for a while, so um, I'll I'll see how fast I can get through it. And but hopefully we'll be able to answer a lot of your questions as we do it. Um, myself personally, um, my background is in philosophy and physics. And uh, so I ended up selling solar. Go figure. <laughs> um, I've been doing it for about 11 years, and uh, I've been in, uh, I, I've had the advantage. I've also weatherized homes, like Marcus, for a couple years, and I did that with government grants for homes that uh, uh, of of people who have low income. And so I've seen the entire spectrum of North Carolina, Western North Carolina society, from the poorest of the poor homes to the richest of the rich. And so it's been kind of a kind of a real opportunity to get to see how people live here. So. Let's see. I, I think it's impressive how well North Carolina is actually doing. Um, we are, and, and we're, it's great to be a leader. And even now, although solar has become more affordable, if you do go solar and you do these things, you should see yourself as a leader. And it's a, um, I try and also talk about politics a lot because there are still reasons why this is, this is a political issue. I see this as kind of an issue of the commons and it's our distant children, uh, great, great great grandchildren and so forth that we are thinking about and that's something that we all have in common. So uh, uh, it, therefore it kind of needs to be political. If one person goes solar it's not going to change the world. Okay, it's, it's, uh, We all kind of need to do it. Billions of people need to do it. And so since billions of people have not done it yet, if you do this you will be leaders 
and so it's good to think of it in terms of politics. And, and so it's good to think that um, we live in a state that's, that uh, is, is kind of a leader. And um, so you're kind of leading the charge. Let's see. Okay, so um, how many of you here are thinking of building a new home? Virtually no one. Now, the last time the three of us talked, uh, it was at a home show, so 80% of people were. So one of the things I always want to bring up, and it's, it, I always see passive sore design is the, the, the other unsung um, aspect of renewable energy and energy efficiency. You can build a home in this climate that requires virtually zero energy to heat or air condition. Okay? It just takes some care in doing it. So if you're thinking about building a new home, or you have friends who are, suggest they look into passive solar design, which I can talk about in some depth, but I'm probably going to gloss over since nobody's doing a new home, and it's really kind of a new home thing. You can do it with an existing home, but it's not a, normally not that great of, there's normally not that much that you can do. So let's see what else. Um, also geothermal, that's another thing that we don't sell geothermal, none of, none of the three of us here do, but it has become a technology that is part of this equation. Um, uh, geothermal is actually a form of, uh, it's not, it's a misnomer. <laughs> it's actually ground source heat. We don't have geothermal here in North Carolina, they have it in Iceland, okay? Here we have ground source heat. And uh, the difference is, um, if you think about it, if you've ever been in a cave in Mexico, for instance, the average temperature in those caves is about 80 degrees. And if you go up to the Arctic or up to Alaska, you have permafrost. The difference in the soil temperature is due to the sun. The average temperature of the soil here is 55 to 60 degrees. And it's that way for quite a ways down into the earth. And that's actually sunshine that's kind of stored in the earth. And so that can be really useful for heating your home. Um, how many here have heat pumps? Heat pumps. Okay, so, whoa, it's um, a heat pump. As you might know, actually a lot of people don't know, so I think it's kind of good to, to say this. Heat pumps um, can be over 100% efficient, which is kind of counterintuitive. That's because they don't generate heat. They pump it. They move it. So um, your heat pump, that's what the unit outside is during the winter, it's actually removing heat from that cold, say, 30-degree or 40-degree outside air and bringing that into your 60 to 70-degree home. Okay, well, if you have ground source heat, then you're trying to instead of pulling out a 30 or even 20 degree air, even in, on when it's zero outside, as it was pretty cold this winter, you can pull it out of that 55, 60 degree soil. So it's way more efficient. The problem is in order to have ground source heat, you have to get, you have to like bore into the ground. So there's two ways that's done, with wells and with um, uh, trenching. And so it can be quite expensive, but there are tax credits available for it. And we have brought homes to zero carbon footprint that are efficient homes that um, they use ground source heat and then they use solar panels and that's oftentimes the best combination because the biggest um, energy load in a house even with all the things we're talking about especially if they don't have passive solar design is normally the heating and air conditioning so right so I, basically obviously we're just going down what it means to have a, a low impact home Wind and microhydro are things that uh, uh, our company can offer, but when you look at the numbers nowadays, um, they, they're not very viable in, in this area. Um, and there's a variety of reasons. It's, uh, politics is as big as any of them. Um, the ridge tops in this state are um, really pretty good for wind, but for aesthetic reasons, uh, members of this state have kind of decided to not use wind here, and that, that argument can be made. Um, but uh, I, at least when I was with the previous company I worked with, we did install a number of wind turbines. And uh, so it, it can be a viable thing. Microhydro can also be viable if you have a reasonable stream. But there's also um, aesthetic issues there and environmental issues, as there is, is with wind. Um, you don't want to remove all the water from your stream. So you can only remove a certain percentage, and you have to get in quite often with the Army Corps of Engineers. And then the tax credits aren't as nice, and then the, the, the buyback rates from the, uh, the utility aren't as nice. So when you add everything up, and, and particularly with uh, microhydro, even if you have a nice stream, microhydro requires more homeowner investment, so to speak, of your, of your, of your, um, your awareness of what's going on. Because microhydro systems require a fair amount of maintenance, and it's really good for the homeowner to understand how they work. So. And then minimal site disturbance. Yes, that's a, um, to, when, at least for myself, like I said, with my background in philosophy and <coughs> physics, I'm very focused on, it, on um, uh, trying to get it right environmentally. And uh, so we try and look at this, the, the situation with your home holistically. 
And um, uh, especially with a new home, um, you know, we've already, I mean, most people here, I assume, the Canary Coalition, don't really want to see um, too much development that, is, uh, that really disturbs the ecosystem. So a low impact home is the best. In my opinion, the best type of home is one that's replacing a home that was already there if you're going to build a new home. So, and small footprint. I, I think there's enough said there. And then highly energy efficient. So we offer two types of solar. There's um, uh, photovoltaics and uh, solar hot water or solar thermal. Uh, this technology has evolved um, dramatically just in the last five years. Um, I think the main thing that's happened is that the Chinese government flooded the market with solar electric modules. And that caused that economy of scale kind of drop the price and then everybody else has been building more and more and made it more affordable and we're getting economies of scales with solar electric such that solar electric for the dollar you spend is normally now just a smarter thing to do. You normally get more energy than solar hot water and that was 10 years ago, even 8 years ago. If I had been standing right here I would have said the reverse. So that has shifted just recently. So our company now about 85 percent of what we're selling is solar electricity and, and like I say six years ago it would have been almost the reverse. Um, solar hot water is a pretty simple idea. You, uh, you know, it hits the, those collectors have uh, copper tubes with, with copper plates in them. Water goes through it, heats it up, and it's a way to heat the water in your water heater and you can also add heat into your house with it. Uh, one, of the dis uh, one of the reasons why it's now being surpassed by solar electricity is that uh, it's, um, there's just more things that can go wrong with solar hot water. You have pumps that can burn out. You have if you have a closed loop system, your glycol can wear out. You know, there's, there's just more things that can go wrong. And if you don't use that solar hot water when it's generated, then you lose that, that energy. Whereas with solar electricity, if you're grid tied, pretty much every kilowatt hour you generate will get used. So beyond the difference in cost now, that's why the solar electricity has basically surpassed the solar hot water for most uses. There are some times when solar thermal does make sense with radiant floor systems. Um, if you have a, a, a large thermal mass that can really store that energy, that can make sense. Um, solar hot water just for a water heater can make sense sometimes in remote locations if you're going off grid. Um, it's still, there's still times that we, we, we do uh, um, advise that it's a good idea. So there's a very typical solar electric array. Um, uh, the way that it works, I mean, I suppose most of you at this point are aware of how solar electricity works. Um, you have silicone crystals doped with some, uh, some trace elements such that when the sunshine hits that silicone crystal, it knocks an electron from the front to the back of it, creates an electric current. Um, it's a DC current, then what we do with that is um, it goes through, an in, uh, for most of the systems that we install, virtually all of them now, it goes through an inverter which then makes it grid compatible AC. And that's all, that's all there is to the system. Uh, there's a disconnect so that the lineman can come turn it off if, there's, if he's working on the grid. Okay, so um, off grid. Um, right. That's your grid type. Okay, thank you. Uh, he's, he's added some to the PowerPoint, so I'm still learning my way through here. Um, uh, so yeah, that's the basic idea there. He goes through your meter. And, the, and with the, 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 the net metering is the, um, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, these are the two options. How many people here are on Duke, Duke Progress? Mm -hmm. How many people aren't? Let's try that. A couple of you. Okay. So the State Utilities Commission has required that Duke do this net metering. And it's another incentive. It's like the tax credits. Duke doesn't really like it. And there are some negatives to net metering. And as more and more people go solar, it might make sense to remove net metering from the equation. Um, basically, net metering means your meter goes forwards and backwards. Um, and, and this is another thing that a lot of people don't have clear uh, in their minds, that the solar energy that you're generating, um, I, the, way I like, the analogy I like to use is like, it's like electricity is like water. I mean, it is and it isn't, but it's kind of like water. And you've got a big pond of water, which is the grid, and you're adding water to that, and you're taking it off as you use it. Okay, And you happen to be doing it right at the same place. So some of it's the same water. But basically, you're doing two different things. You're consuming it in your house, and you're producing it on your roof. And the grid is just kind of like the, the lake it's going into and coming out of. Okay, It's not like it directly goes from the solar electric panels into like the things you're using in your home. I mean, it does and it doesn't, if you understand the analogy. So um, at any rate, so net metering. That means that your meter, in essence, goes forwards and backwards. 
Um, and what that means is that you get to give the power, if you're generating more power on your roof than the house is consuming, then your meter will run backwards and the, the utility will have to buy it back from you at a retail rate. And you can understand why they don't like that, because how do they make money? Okay, they've got their meter fees that they charge, but um, when they have to buy it back at a retail rate, they can't make the little profit because they would like to buy it back at a wholesale rate. And if you're, and, um, if you're not with Duke, you're probably with a co-op, say Haywood EMC. Okay, Haywood doesn't net meter because they don't have to. Go figure. So what they do is sell excess, and that means you will give your excess power back to them at a wholesale rate. So this is like you buy it for 11 cents, you give it, sell it back for 11 cents. This is you buy it for 11 cents, you sell it back for like 4 cents. Not as good of a deal. But you can join North Carolina Green Power, which is still an organization that will per and, and give them your power bills. You send them their power bills, and they will, pur they will um, purchase the renewable energy credit for, for um, you generating your power for like another six cents, so it adds up again to like 10 or 11 cents. So you can still do this, but there's more caveats and it's not quite as simple. So, all right, so uh, at least one of you here said you wanted to go off grid just to get away from Duke. <laughs> okay, well that's still sort of problematic. If you're hope uh, the price of the solar modules has gone way down, but the battery technology has yet to catch up. It's, um, they've gotten better, the batteries have, um, but batteries are still expensive. They still are the weakest link, they wear out the soonest. And, um, and most people find that they just, they can't make the, the, the numbers work up as far as their return on investment and the, what you're doing. But you can do it. Um, and it also involves, again, back your motivation. And there are environmental reasons to do batteries. Okay, even though batteries have, you know, they use, heavy metals and so forth, um, the solar, just like wind, um, they both do need some sort of storage vessel, okay? And so it's really nice to have a battery. Um, but again, it's expensive. But it's even still, this is less expensive than it was in, say, the 70s or 80s. Now, we've all got kind of a different mindset about that. In the 70s or 80s, the, the back to the landers, they were okay having solar systems that use maybe five kilowatt hours a day. But nowadays, people are like, they have no desire to do that. And I think it's just a shift in our culture. I'm not sure that's a good shift, but that's just what's happened. Because uh, the average American household uses 30. And so I'll have people come up to me and say, well, I'm using 30 kilowatt hours a day. How much does it cost to do this? And I'm like, well, you know, $60,000, $70,000, something like that. And they're like, no. <laughs> so um, it's, it's not as viable. But it still can be. Uh, you know, if, if you do all the things with your energy efficiency, if you just do certain loads, especially if you have passive solar design, there's still times that, that it makes sense and there are people out there who are doing it and are very happy with the lifestyle they have. But uh, one other thing, just to give you an idea of lifespan, the solar modules have, uh, virtually all of them now have 25 year warranties and they should last like 100 years. So they, they, they slowly de decrease in the amount of energy they're producing, but uh, they're gonna last a long time and produce for a long, long time. Um, batteries can really vary. If you're totally off grid and you're deep cycling that battery every day and night, you know, you're using your solar power at night, um, they might last only three to five years. If you use the batteries for emergencies because you want, you, one of your things is you might be a survivalist or a prepper or something, you're concerned that the grid is going to go away, um, then if the battery is just sitting there and you get an expensive nice one, it can last up to 20 years. So there's some variation there. So. All right, so now we're going to do the tax credits. Um, they're pretty simple. There's a 35% North Carolina tax credit. Uh, for um, if, if it's a residential system, you have uh, caps on it. So um, these are for the solar thermal. You see they're not as nice. Here's the one for the PV. And um, then the federal one's 30%. And then these are nice little incentives, but they're not huge. So we tend to gloss over them. Um, and you can read what they say there. They, uh, um, they'll help you with your praise. Um, yeah, you don't get that much tax if you, um, and when you're getting your property tax due to the addition of the solar costs. So I want to mention, uh, because I don't think we're going to talk commercial here. I just did uh, four site visits today in the Silva area. And the one that I think they're going to buy a system is actually a dentist. Okay, um, if you have a commercial property or you have a, a business, the commercial is uh, more viable than the residential because the tax credits are better. Um, there's no cap, 
on the on the PV. There, there's a slide. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I might. Even, I don't know if I'm going to get to that. Gotcha. I mean, so uh, th there's no cap on the PV, and um, and you can depreciate the cost of your system. So, and I don't know if we're going to get to. See, I'm not as familiar with the slides as, as Mark is here, but let's see what happens. Yeah, I don't, is this going to be on here as far as um, your return on investment? Is that mentioned on the on the? Okay, so I'll I'll okay, bring so that up. Let me go back here. Um, a slide about accelerated depreciation. Okay, yeah, but let's let's talk about a uh, return on investment because that might be one of the biggest questions in the room. Um, if everything is working right for most of the residential solar s electric systems that we're installing. And by everything working right, I mean you have a nice south-facing roof because it's easier to install on a roof than on the ground. It costs less money, okay? And you don't have trees shading your property or shading that roof. And, uh, you know, and it's a reasonable size system. That, and you can take the tax credits. So all those things, all those ducks have to be lined up there. Then the return on investment right now is about 10 years, okay? So that's probably a number you want to know. It's, it's shifted a lot. And when, I, when I started this, it was like 23 years. So it's, it's 10 years. Um, with a with the commercial systems, it can be as low as three, okay. But it's normally like five. Five years is pretty normal for commercial because they can depreciate the cost of the system. So that becomes like just kind of a really smart thing to do for a system that after five years is going to be yeah. If the return on investment is ten years, where's the incentive if you're going with deep cycle batteries? You have to change every five years. Uh, I'm talking about if everything's lined up. If you're going with a battery, there's, the return on investment isn't 10 years. <laughs> it's worse than that. Okay. The battery systems, are, most of the systems that we're putting in are straight grid tie with no battery. Okay. Those have the 10 year return on investment. And I would like to talk for just a moment about return on investment because that's one of the biggest subjects that I always discuss when I go out and film. Everybody's really interested in it, and that's fair. Part of the motivation for this still is, and I don't see this going away for, uh, even, even for a few more years. It's still, it's still political. It's still like climate change. <laughs> you know, it's environmental. And um, it, uh, we find that there's still, even with the great commercial ones, it's pretty rare that somebody does this just because of the return on investment. They, they're, there's still an environmental motivation. That's certainly why I'm in the business. So, um, and, and we could go into that, but I don't, I don't see the point of that right now. So let's see. So yeah, he's laid out some costs here. And I'm going to gloss over the thermal. We can go back to that if somebody wants to talk about it. And then, then we're in the commercial. So is that, is that the end of it for me? Uh, yeah, you, we, I can talk about the commercial quickly if you want. OK. If you, well, I'll go ahead and do it. I'll go ahead and do it. Why not? Um, I think I've already said with the. <coughs> one more. There you go. Yeah, so those are the big things. And this depreciation makes all the difference. And it is true. Um, roofs normally are the best place, and, and there's a huge variety of ways that we can make this work. So um, it, 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 you, it's nice to have a south-facing roof or a flat roof. If you have roofs that are facing due east and west and they're steep, or if they're north-facing, and this is for household or business, it's harder to make it work. Those numbers don't add up as much. Because if you think about it, let's, let's think of a roof that's shaded half, half day, OK? You're getting half as much power for the money you spend. So your return on investment is twice as long. <laughs> so, so some people find they need to cut trees down, and, and, you know, and, they, and some people do, and some don't. It just depends on all sorts of variables there. <coughs> Solar thermal for commercial buildings can still make a lot of sense. Uh, depending on the situation, um, there, there can be a good return on investment, again, because of the, of the depreciation, but also because there's ways that you can use solar for a for heating systems where there's a, a continuous load um, to heat water, um, we, it, it can still make a lot of sense. So there you go. All right. All right. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> yeah, look it up. <laughs> uh, all right. So. This is what we're after, right? Uh, a lot of us, anyway, um, besides the monetary reasons, um, we want to do this for environmental reasons. And, and for a lot of what 
my personal belief anyway, and I'll just share this with you all. Um, if you're looking for something to do right now today that's going to help combat uh, the, you know, the, the negatives that, that are uh, happening because of fossil fuels, the, the best thing, in my opinion, to make the biggest difference today is to make your home more energy efficient. Uh, when, you, when, you, when you start to think about the future and your legacy and what you want to leave behind, uh, we just heard that these panels are going to last 30 years, and for warranty sake anyway. Um, but in, even, even after that, um, these panels keep producing. And we're, so if we're talking about a legacy that you're going to leave behind, uh, solar, solar is a great legacy. Um, that's not where that's supposed to be. There we go. All right, so um, if you want in and you want to find out you know, what, what do we do next? I'm going to circle back around a little bit to what, what we talked about before. Uh, there are six really easy main steps to get you going here. Uh, we have a beautiful website, uh, cleanenergy4.us, um, and on the top of that page, you'll find your different programs uh, at the top of that page under uh, Find My Program. Uh, the WNC program is what, where all this, where it will be located. Uh, there, about halfway down, there's a button. You click on the button. You fill out an enrollment form. Uh, the enrollment form is uh, maybe 15 questions, uh, and they range from uh, what your goals are, uh, what your address is, what your uh, what kind of budget you're looking to stay uh, stay in, uh, and this all helps us with our initial assessment of who to pair you up with, as far as uh, you know what your goals are, what you're looking for. Um, and we go ahead and do a, a simple assessment. If it's solar, we'll go ahead and do a simple assessment based on uh, Google Earth or Bing Maps. Uh, if we see a bunch of trees around, or if we see something that maybe will negatively impact uh, your solar exposure, uh, we'll, go, we'll, we'll call you up or get in touch with you and say, you know, are, are trimming the trees something that you're willing to do? Uh, if the answer is yes, then we'll proceed. If uh, the answer is no, then, you know, like, like we talked about before, if the sun can't shine on the panel, then, you know, there's not much we can do, we can do for you. Um, but the enrollment form is where we gather that initial information. Uh, at that point, you'd have your status assigned, and if you think back to that uh, original uh, graphic with the big circle and, and you go, can go either direction for solar or energy efficiency, uh, that's your status. Are you EE in solar, or EE meaning energy efficiency, or are you solar? Maybe you're both, which would be great as well. Um, but you have your status assigned. Uh, you would get together your utility bills because that's something that we're always interested in, how much you're currently using now, how much you want to offset, how much can your roof space hold uh, to help you offset your current load. Um, and the energy bills are, are a great way, a great resource for us to, to see what's happening currently, see what's happened in the past, and, and see where we can get you going to. Um, expect a phone call from uh, Marcus or Ben or, or someone from uh, one of the other uh, companies that we work with and they're going to want to schedule an on-site assessment with you uh, come out walk around your property uh, or do an energy audit uh, and so that's how really you get going here uh, really simple easy steps and uh, the last thing I have here and I'll and I'll read this uh, for you this is a this is a quote from Mike uh, Fleener uh, Asheville Solar Company put this uh, array on his house uh, I think that's a six kilowatt uh, array uh, nicely shaped around the, um, the opening of the skylight on the roof. Uh, he says, had I gone in this alone, I would, have ha I would have had to have been pretty motivated to get through the red tape and in the end made a thrown in the towel in frustration. Um, and he goes on to talk about Duke and how they're not the best at explaining from A to Z how to get from where you currently are to uh, installing solar and, and, getting in and getting your home more energy efficient. Um, uh, he talks about how engaged uh, the program is and, and how much information that he found out about it. Uh, so this, was a, this is a really great success story, and we've had many other ones like this uh, around, but uh, Mike uh, has been at a couple of speaking engagements with us as well. He's really passionate about what he's done, and, and really the, the legacy discussion that, I, that I, we talked about before was, was something that was really important to him. They moved up here from Alabama. Uh, and he used to work um, for the EPA in Alabama and saw uh, firsthand the, the, the air quality issues that, um, that Marcus had, had spoken to before about uh, respiratory issues and things like that. And uh, he talked about his legacy and what was going to be here even after he's gone. And, um, and the legacy of, of solar and leaving this on his roof was something that, that he really wanted to do. Um, wait, wait. Go back to that thing. <laughs> Look at that beautiful tree shading the solar system. 
So, well, uh, you don't know how far away that that's a reflection. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> you got to make some sacrifices. I will say that you got to make some sacrifices. And I mentioned before some of the the uh, the great groups that we've worked with uh, and some of the great companies that we've worked with. And so this is just uh, you know kind of what I'm going to leave up here for now. Um, you know, but we've we've had a great track record and uh, a great a lot of great success stories and they've um, uh, they've come from all over North Carolina and uh, we're just really excited to be in your area as well and so um, I'll go ahead and, and uh, invite these guys back up here uh, and if you have any questions about uh, the program uh, solar uh, or energy efficiency let's raise them up and we'll get some questions answered and start in the front right here so uh, there are loans through I mean how does that work Uh, there are loans available. Uh, and we have uh, worked with two partners, one national, one local. Uh, Admirals Bank uh, does give a loan for, for solar, uh, and Self Help Credit Union uh, locally does give a loan for solar. Uh, your and energy efficiency. Yeah. Uh, uh, your best bet uh, is a, a home equity line of credit, which is uh, otherwise called a HELOC. Um, that's your that's your best bet because basically it's it's uh, it's a loan, um, but you can use that uh, money for roof improvements if uh, if that was necessary. Um, it's it's not a loan with any parameters. Basically, you can do whatever you'd like with that, and usually the interest rate is much lower. I, I know also Asheville Savings Bank in Asheville does. I'm not sure um, who in Franklin would do that, but I, I bet we could figure that out. Asheville Savings Bank has a pretty good interest rate for home equity loan such that it's only slightly more than like your power bill savings. So that is that you'd be, yeah, you wouldn't be saving money, but you wouldn't be spending money mm -hmm. and you would um, have, you know, close to zero carbon footprint potentially. So that's kind of a nice feature. Yes, sir. You say that the 35% uh, energy credit for the state of North Carolina uh, is going to be expiring. Didn't the same thing happen a couple of years ago and they renewed it? And are they going to renew it if it expires this year? Do you have any idea about that? They, they just now put a, there's a bill on the form now. And um, we're getting hopeful. You know, our, you know, our legislature has been kind of wild and crazy, a lot of us feel. And, um, but they, uh, it looks like there's both Republicans and Democrats who are sponsoring it. So the only person who I know of, who at least I, I saw a quote where he was against it, was the governor. And um, but he might come around, you know, to legislate for it. Which is what I put in this, uh, the slide earlier about some of the numbers that have been coming out of um, reported lately from Duke University and the North Carolina Sustainable Energy Association. Um, our uh, the economics and the job creation that we're talking about, the 20, almost 24,000 jobs in the green sector, including energy efficiency and solar and a few others. Um, uh, billions of dollars in revenue, over $4 billion in revenue. And so what's the big argument when we start talking about um, uh, fracking, offshore drilling, um, TransCanada uh, pipelines? What's, what's the big argument? Jobs. Jobs. And so once we start interjecting job creation into uh, renewable and solar, is people start <laughs> to listen. And so the Energy Freedom Act, or, uh, inter is that what it's called? Modernization. Uh, Energy Freedom Act that's uh, that's in uh, right now that's going through the House uh, is is brought up by re Republican uh, representatives and so uh, we've got their ear. Yes, how long uh, would you normally arrange? Uh, would you expect it would take to recoup your investment? Uh, the annual savings? How long would it be take? It's there's a lot of factors that go. You're talking about solar or energy efficiency? Yeah, somewhere. To uh, it, there's a lot of factors that, that go into it, and, and Ben, I'll let you expand on this a little bit. But um, you know, without w this is why we do a preliminary site assessment without knowing your roof size, w which way it's oriented. Uh, have you uh, done energy efficiency measures in your home? Um, all that is going to affect your payback time. Uh, and so we had a, a, a simple payback up there, a twenty thousand dollar five kilowatt system. Uh, you take away roughly sixty to sixty five percent of that uh, initial cost through tax incentives. Uh, you're looking at um, typically about a, a 10 to 11 year payback time. I found just recently it's 
It just depends, again, your solar window is a huge factor. So if you have full sunshine on a roof that's easy to install modules on, it's going to be 10 years. If you have it's half shaded, you know, that's going to make it a lot longer. So that really does matter a lot. Um, so I, at least the last few months, I've been averaging around 13 or 14 years, because it seems like every, every house I go to, there's a lot of shade. But you know, that might switch here in the next couple of weeks. It just varies. Marcus, what, what do you think for your, maybe your, your average? Uh, Three to five. We don't recommend anything that's seven. That takes longer than seven years to pay it off. Not saying don't do it, but just generally, it's yeah. it's a good investment at seven years. Um, we invest in things that take that don't give us a payback. We have to keep that in mind. Beach trips, sports cars. You know, we 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 put money in there that don't give us any returns. And so we kind of have to maybe change and shift the way we think and say, hey, instead of going out and buying that T-bone for thirty-five dollars, I'll I'll put some money towards the solar system, which is is a good investment for the future. I mean, it, it, again, it's like there is a political side to this. That it's like it's a statement that you're making, that's, and it's also helping an industry grow. Mm -hmm. Like if, if other people before you hadn't put solar systems on, we wouldn't be talking to you. <laughs> so it's like it's, there, there are reasons to do it beyond the financial. But the financial is getting better and better and better, and it's you know, relatively good now. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so Duke Energy and the government are in the same frame of mind in a political uh, situation where you're just going to legislation to change where feedback will be less. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's, um, I can't ever remember the name, but it's an acronym for it. It's a, it's a kind of a right-wing organization that is like um, trying to lobby different state legislatures. Uh, yeah, yeah. And they've done this nationwide, and they've now succeeded in two states to get rid of net meter, or at least to really break down. Uh, the biggest one and, and, uh, is out in Arizona, where they're allowing net metering, but the utility is getting to charge a $50 monthly fee <laughs> if you put solar on. And so that just kind of blows the incentive all to hell. So it's, uh, uh, that's something I'm very concerned about. Solar City, I don't know if you remember with Elon Musk, Tesla, those guys, mm -hmm. they're suing that in court now, and they think they might win, because the, the people of Arizona don't agree with it. The, the overwhelming majority of people in Arizona want the incentive to stay. But it's, it's kind of the, you know, the big utility with the government or in cahoots. And so hopefully that's, a, that's something that, that there's going to be enough political effort pushback that that's not going to be a major problem. But I, I wanted to say one thing which I didn't say earlier about net metering. I started to say it. Um, here's a problem with net metering. It's not a progressive incentive, not in this country. The reason being, um, it, the tax credits are the huge incentive. And, and about half this country doesn't pay much in the way of an income tax. So it's a middle class to wealthier person's gain to do solar. So they do solar, then they get the net metering and the utility's going, okay, well if we get tons of people doing solar and they're getting, you know, we're having to buy back at this wholesale rate, we're providing them basically with a battery, we're gonna raise the power rates. And they raise it on everybody, including the poor. So it's not a progressive incentive, and that's the argument. And that's why the, the, the local, um, uh, the co-ops aren't doing it. Now, there's tons of arguments to still do it, because it's such a hard thing to get people to do solar anyway. I'm, I'm all for the incentive and keeping it going as long as possible, but as the price drops, I think the idea of selling it back at a wholesale rate is, is good, and that's one other thing. There is a chance that batteries are gonna get much more affordable, so you can put them on. But back to Tesla and Elon Musk, he's claiming he's gonna do a whole house battery is coming out within about five months that might <coughs> revolutionize the industry. But people have been saying that about renewable energy forever, so we're crossing our fingers. Yes, sir. Isn't it true that if you finance your solar energy system or energy efficiency, that you'll come out ahead on a monthly basis from the beginning? In many cases. Um, in other words, the servicing of the loan every month is less than the amount of energy you're saving it's right about equal if everything's working right. Like that, the Asheville Savings Bank, it looks like that is what's going to happen there. Um, so, so, so when you talk about payback, that kind of scrambles the whole thing because it's paying back immediately. Right. right. So, yeah, and, and actually Germany, which is leading the world in this, their utilities were required to pay such a high rate for, for solar power that people could just put it on their credit cards. And then the, the savings, they pay off their credit cards. That, of course, will become more true as the cost of energy goes up higher and higher, which inevitably will. So, so uh, 
and the, but I think the key to not to wait for the battery technology and the other things to catch up is what we're dealing with right now is, is the tax is the tax incentive and and the threat that it, that it would expire. And it's it's another thing. It's been a moving target. Okay, the incentives that people we keep producing them. You know, there, there's reasons to do this that will probably continue even as some things go away and other things are added. As the price drops, the, then the, the tax credits might go away eventually. But hopefully, you know, as long as we stay motivated to do it, we can really make this happen. And it has been happening. Yes, in the front. And refrigerators are really that much more efficient over like 2001. If I had one, it's that old. Mm -hmm. That's my, to my knowledge. It. It's a question for Marcus. I wouldn't necessarily get rid of it. Um, if you have grandma's fridge that hasn't worked for well, hours, you can get rid of that one. <laughs> and um, it was leaking water and I got rid of it. I got this one and yeah. saved me ten dollars a month on the electric bill right off. So it's right. paid for itself real good, but mm -hmm. versus net what's one of the It depends down. on the fridge. Generally, you know, the, the energy code has changed drastically over the last twenty years. So you could test it for a few bucks, you can get a meter and, and see how much it actually is costing you. Um, if what? you have two you know, the one thing our attitude is there's no need for two refrigerators. If you do have two and one standing, I looked. I opened the door to a fridge today. There was a six pack of beer in it in the basement. <laughs> Put stuff in it. Put jugs of water in it. But um, you know, you can certainly make the argument that it's worth replacing, and you you get a rebate for it too. That would be hundred bucks mm -hmm. to, to recycle it. Will that refrigerator test be included in one of your whole house? Audits? We'll look at the fridge, and and we can tell a lot from that. Um, the, you really need to plug something in for about four or five hours. We're usually only there for two. Yes, sir. Are there companies that will do all the financing and actually own the installation and then lease back? Not yet. Not in North Carolina. Not in North Carolina. No. That, it's, that, it's, uh, that's that's called third party. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's part of the bill that's on the floor. There's a new bill to like make that more more viable. I think we're one of five states in the in the country that doesn't currently have uh, third party financing. Yeah. I think it's important if they do that. You Remember, when you go to sell your house, you have a piece of equipment that doesn't belong to you behind your roof. And it could be a glitch when you go to sell it with the bank in the loan process. Mm -hmm. Are there washer dryer rebates right now? Yeah. Yeah. In the back, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Can you give us a casual <coughs> ballpark figure on, say, a 1,500, 1,700 foot square house? No tree removal, just an easy installation with good southern exposure. Rough idea of the cost of the system to be installed up and running, and what you might average kilowatts per hours per day. And, 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 this area. and that's something that I didn't cover amazingly. I, I was thinking about that when I sat down. Um, it's hard to answer, and the way I answer that, because it's in, in a lot of ways the central question, is that there are four variables, and, it's, it, and, I, and if I come out to your house, I'll mention them again, <laughs> okay? Because it helps you clarify in your mind what it is we're doing as we try and figure out what solar system makes sense for you. Mm -hmm. There are four variables that determine the size of the system. The first one is aesthetics. I just, they're random how I order them, but the first one is aesthetics. Like a lot of people, they, they don't like how it looks in a certain area, and that's fair. You know, our neighbors don't, or whatever, okay? Um, so the, once we overcome that, the next one is your solar window on your property. So someplace on that property, you're either going to have it or you're not. It's going to be a certain size, and, and that is a variable to determine the size of the system. So I, you know, open pasture. Right. So, so, so you've got, so, so then that variable no isn't the, that variable then would not be the determining variable. It would just be because you could do anything. Okay, so the next variable would be producing as much power as you consume. Okay, a lot of people want to think that's the variable because that's the environmental variable. That's probably why you're all sitting here. Okay, um, to produce as much power as you consume. But I find that most people don't produce as much power as they consume when they put a solar system on because of the last variable, which is financial. Do you have the money? How much money can you afford to put? Do you owe taxes? If you don't owe taxes, most people aren't going to do this if they can't take the tax credits because it can cut the system cost over half, as you saw. Okay, so between those four, the, it gets determined. Now, um, let's take the variable out. Say, say you're in an open pasture, you've got clear, and you want a thousand kilowatts per kilowatt hour. 
Okay, so that variable would then be producing as much power as you consume, presumably. So I, I would say that's the determining <laughs> variable. So, so the average American household uses 30 kilowatt hours a day, okay? We rarely put in systems that make that much. Um, but right, and then, then with regard to cost, there's a sweet spot for residential, which is most of what people do, which is between $10,000 and $30,000. If it's less than 10000 the economy of scale isn't there because you get the labor, the rack, all the stuff going on. Over $30,000, you have maxed out the state tax credit. Okay, So then depending on your house, if you have a house that's got a great solar window and everything is right, $30,000 can roughly make you 30 kilowatt hours a day. Okay, So that, that, that's probably the best thing I can tell you. But, but again, it, it, there, there's enough things that, that don't hold me to that number, but that can happen and that does occasionally. Okay. For that 30 kilowatt, how many solar panels are you talking about? Uh, 30. Are well, you have to have a whole pipe to pull? No, no. <laughs> no, uh, let's see, it's, it's roughly, again, I'm using roundage <laughs> numbers, roughly 10 kilowatt system. And, ah, uh, I just got to stand by the light. Sorry, yeah. I want to back up here. This is a 6 kilowatt system right here. And I was thinking that was smaller than that when you said that. <laughs> it looks like there's solar panels on the front of this right. house. You're right. You're right. Let me back up. Put out on that picture. Yeah. Well, that's an example of somebody that right is wanting to do <laughs> more. You know, it, they're wanting to do as much as they can, and they have the money to do that. Now, if you're talking about pastures, you know, is there a business opportunity or is there a business name there? Because then it's a whole different ballgame, um, and then everything gets much better for a business. So, you know, it's even been suggested that so you could start. So, how many panels are you going to have to put? Okay, our, the standard panel that we are installing now is a 280 to 285 watts. So you can divide, you know, 10 kilowatts by 280 watts, and you get the number of panels. I always have to take that phone. I don't have a real mind for numbers. How big is the panel? Like 10 foot? Uh, those panels are. I do them in feet because the what everybody thinks in they're 3.3 feet by 5.5. And they're always about that same ratio, correct? Because that's. <laughs> Is that without a battery or anything? They're almost exactly. Greater energy. And also, I, I sort of, with your pasture question, ground mounts cost more money, too. So I'm always thinking in terms of roof mounts. Ground mounts almost always do because you got to drive. You didn't have a problem. Right. Uh, 280 watt panel, how many amps does it produce when it's in full sunlight? Well, those are 24 watt uh, that, that varies a little bit, and I, I don't want to tell you that number, because I I'm not, I'm not, don't remember it, to be honest. I don't want a mini hydro system, and I run the whole house on like six amps DC. I've got a small house. And it's DC as well, which doesn't require any kind of no, inverter. I've converted to AC. Actually, I should have brought it in, because I had a brochure on the module, and it's got the graph. That's another thing that we didn't discuss here. Um, that inverter technology has been changing rather rapidly in the last like 10 years. And uh, there's right now, and, and there's some new ones on the horizon that are going to be different than these, but there's basically three inverter options. So I did the review for some of you. The inverter takes the DC power, which is where the electrons are kind of flowing one direction, <coughs> and converts it to AC, <coughs> so it's away. And um, the, the, the kind of the workhorse inverter is one inverter or two for the whole array, say. If it's a, say it's a 10 kilowatt array, it might be two inverters, two 5,000 watt inverters. And, um, and that might be down near your meter, okay? But they now have come up with an inverter, uh, one company kind of revolutionized the industry called Enphase, and it's a, it's a little inverter that goes on the back of each module. So then the current coming off the module into the wires is now AC, and, um, and they, uh, they have some advantages. The, the main advantage is, is that when um, there's shade moving across the roof, it'll just, it'll just affect the module the shade is hitting instead of a whole string. Okay? And so then, then there's a middle option where you have part of the job of inversion is done by something called an optimizer behind the module, and then you've got a smaller inverter down by the meter. So, yes? These, of course, uh, look stationary, and I saw somewhere if you had a panel that would follow the sun, and I know it would be more expensive, but it, it would capture 30 or 
40% more of solar than just the standard solid model. And, and as that, that used to be common, um, and still in large arrays, sometimes it is like for like industrial utility scale arrays, they somehow make the economy scale work. It used to be common to have like motors, and there were different ways to do it even without motors. But those parts cost more money and they wear out, and now it's just the modules have gotten cheap enough that you can gain that extra wattage just by throwing another module on there and you've got a simpler system that'll last longer. So, so they don't do that very often. Now sometimes it makes sense for people doing ground mounts to do a pole mount because they don't have a spot to put like a rack mount. And the pole mounts, we, people regularly will adjust those like twice a year, like you know, for a summer sun and a winter sun. But other than that, the, the trackers are pretty rarely done now. You guys are asking some amazing questions, and a lot of them are, are very specific and site-specific to, to you all's place. And so um, I'll just go back to participating in the program and, and to say that there's no obligation to enroll there and to have um, one of these guys come out and take a look specifically at your site and answer some of these questions um, specific to and let them, them put eyes on it. Uh, Again, you know, it's it's just about enrolling and, and entering in your information. Can you explain how the tax credit works? Do you actually have to owe more than the rebate to get it? Or? Uh, you you have to have tax liability. Uh, you you can't. I mean, there. Let's let's say that you. Um, one of the things we didn't mention is that you can take that tax credit for five years. So let's say even if the even if the tax credit goes away at the end of this year. If you get a system in this year, you're grandfathered in and you can take it for five years. So let's say you put a $30,000 system on, then you're eligible for that full $10,500 state tax credit. You can take that for five years, which is $2,100 a year. So between what you might have withheld and of, if that's what you, if your liability is that big or bigger, you'll be able to take the whole thing. And that's, and that's even if nothing renews at the end of this year, they can't take that away. If you get your system this year, they can't say, well, you only have one year to reclaim that tax liability. Yes, you know, for five years, even after this year, you can still claim that tax liability. Yes. Is it possible to enroll? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And then there is a fee for that. Um, generally for this area of retail, we, we charge $500, and we arrange to charge 100 and money of that goes to Energy, or, or goes to the Canary Coalition, but we're spending a lot more time at your house, and then we're also writing up a room. You get a, a detailed report, it's about 12 pages long, that shows you with infrared images and all the data that, that you can basically leave with the house. Um, it's something that's quite bad, you know, we consider quite valuable. There's a few of that. I see, I hear a lot of talking. Any, any, uh, any other questions? I mean. I, that's perfect to talk amongst yourselves and talk to us, and, and we'll stick around for a moment if, if you'd like. What do you recommend to the appliances for your washer? How do you use that washer and dryer? The clothes, the clothes dryer is the most efficient one. There are about four lines on some poles in the yard. Um, <laughs> there is no uh, efficient clothes dryer, and there is no efficient oven or stove because they're designed to flash. Everything else go with an energy solution makes it better. Um, it depends on, on your what you know. If you're going with photovoltaics, I'd say go with an all electric home. The one thing about an all electric home is it's dependent on uh, you're dependent on coal, but you can be dependent on the sun. With gas, you're dependent on where is that gas being produced, how is it being produced, whose water is catching on fire in their communities in Kentucky to provide you with that gas. So personally, I'm a fan of wood because it's a renewable resource that we can't get grows. Um, and also uh, all electric because we can switch over to an, uh, a, photo, a house on solar. So the person that's my favorite, passive solar, wood heat, and all electric. We've got one more announcement from Avram. Uh, we're we're going to stick around and close up the room. So if you'd like to talk to us one on one, we'll, we'll be around. There's information on the back table if you guys didn't pick up a flyer already. Uh, if you missed out on something, you need information from us. It's on the web, or you can stop by. I don't have any more cards left, but I'd be happy to write down any contact information that you need. So, but but thank you, and and uh, Avram's got one more announcement for us. Well, I just I want to thank everybody for coming, and I want to tell you a little <coughs> bit about some important legislation that was touched upon 
uh, during the discussion earlier. There are three bills that are pending right now in North Carolina General Assembly, and we need to show support for these bills because it'll make it, every, it'll make it easier for everybody to get solar energy if these three bills get passed. One is uh, House Bill 377, which is also Senate Bill 483, called the Efficient and Affordable Energy Rates Bill. And uh, three things it would do, create an inverted tiered block utility rate structure, meaning that the more energy you use, the more you pay, and the less energy you use, the less you pay per kilowatt hour. So it's a par powerful incentive. And then it would also create an energy efficiency bank in North Carolina that would issue low interest loans for rate payers um, and, and uh, the third thing it would do is create a tax on the purchase of non-efficient electrical appliances and that money the collected from the tax would be earmarked to feed the energy efficiency bank to go into more solar and, and energy efficiency projects. Uh, the second piece of legislation is called the Energy Freedom Act. It's House Bill 245 and, and I'm going to hand these out or, or I'll put these on the back table there for anybody who hasn't gotten one yet. House Bill 245, the Energy Freedom Act, would permit the, the uh, third party sales of electricity in North Carolina. Right now, it's, Ill it's illegal to sell energy if you're not Duke Energy, basically, in, in, North, in this part of the state or, or if, if you're one of the existing co-ops. And so this would allow um, contractors to come in and sell you, and install, the, sort of do a rent to own thing with you, so there's no upfront cost for you to install solar energy on your home. And um, they would charge you for the electricity that is produced by the panels until the panels are paid off, basically, and then it's yours. Um, that's one of the things that this bill would allow, but in general, it would allow third-party sales of electricity breaking the monopoly of Duke Energy. Um, the third bill is uh, House Bill 454, S447, it's Senate Bill 447, House Bill 454, um, which is the solar tax credit extension. So the tax credit is due to end at the end of this year, December 31st. This bill would extend it to 2021. And so it's really important that we show support for these bills right now. So I'm going to put these on the back table, take one of these, and, and I also put the uh, contact information for our Senator Jim Davis, uh, Representative Joe Sam Queen and Representative Roger West, who are our legislators here in, in the western part of the state. Thank you all for being here again, and uh, please keep in touch with us. If you haven't signed in, please sign in. Thanks very much, guys. Appreciate it.